Financial Diaries uh, project is an effort to gain a lot greater understanding of the financial lives of low and moderate income Americans. Some of the first research that's come out of that uh, project uh, are six household profiles of six participants in the study. Uh, if you have not seen those household profiles which were released this summer, you can download them from our website, usfinancialdiaries.org, and click on the Research and Publications tab. Uh, and you'll see summaries and the ability to download each of those household profiles. We'll be talking about three of the six today. Our participants today are uh, Jonathan Mordock, who's Executive Director of the Financial Ex Access Initiative and one of our principal investigators for the project, as well as Rachel Schneider, who's the Senior Vice President for Insight and Analytics at the Center for Financial Services Innovation, or CFSI, uh, and one of our key partners on the USFD project, one of our principal investigators. Joining us are two members of our advisory board, uh, J. Michael Collins, who's the faculty director of the Center for Financial Security at the University of Wisconsin, where he studies consumer decision making in the financial marketplace, and Kathy Mahan, who's president and CEO of the National Federation of Community Development Credit Unions. Uh, Kathy was previously the deputy commissioner for, for financial empowerment at the U New York City Department of Consumer Affairs. A very quick overview of what we'll be doing. We want to give you some background on the project, and then we're going to go look specifically at three of the families from our household profiles. Then we're going to uh, get some insight from Michael and Kathy um, uh, how they view these profiles, and then we're going to open it up for questions and discussion about uh, what these profiles mean for how we should be thinking about financial services for low and moderate income Americans. So with that, um, let me just briefly mention um, our sponsors for the project. Uh, who we're very grateful to. This is a long-term and quite expensive project uh, and has been led by the Ford Foundation and the City Foundation underwriting the cost of this multi-year research, uh, joined by the Omidyar Network, uh, who's providing some additional help in helping us disseminate uh, and engage audiences with this content. So we're deeply grateful to each of those foundations. With that, let me turn it over to Jonathan Mordock, who's going to give us some background on the project, and then Rachel Schneider will be talking to us about some of the families. Jonathan? Great, thanks, Tim. So this is a national um, research project. We've been collecting data in four U.S. regions, and we are just wrapping up data collection. We're still in the field, um, and over the next few months, we'll be wrapping it up. Today, we're going to be presenting um, some of the preliminary results and focus on a few households. The idea of this research is getting to spend a lot of time with a smaller group of households than you would find in a typical um, large sociological or economic or financial survey. We're spending time with 200 low and moderate income households in the four U.S. regions you see here, around New York, in Southwest Ohio and Kentucky, uh, Eastern Mississippi, and the South Bay in Northern California. I should say 200 is, um, is on the low end where the number um, is between 200 and 250. Our idea is to really get to know the households well, build trust with them, see them over time. The field researchers who are in each of the sites and have been based there for a year meet with the households roughly every two or three weeks and track everything the households are earning, everything they're spending, everything they're saving, everything they're borrowing, everything they're investing to the best of our ability. It's all self-reported data, but we spend a lot of time with the households and have built structures and methodology um, to really try to nail down the quantities as well as we can. The big idea is to take the time to get a sense of often hidden ways that households manage their finances, to really see a lot of things which are going on in the informal sector, just with family and friends, as well as with formal sector banks and credit unions um, and other kinds of opportunities that people have open to them. So we see it as somewhere between the ideas, the sort of quantitative structural approach of large quantitative surveys, which are very powerful for testing hypotheses, but which don't really allow you to get to know households well. Something between that and small-scale ethnographic studies, which are um, very, very powerful, provide very rich qualitative data, but don't usually focus on the kind of quantitative and qualitative data that we as um, researchers interested in, interested in financial innovation, financial services innovation, 
real financial and economic lives of poor households, um, those kinds of approaches don't usually focus there. So we've got a high frequency data set, a real deep dive into the lives of over 200 families across the country. In addition to doing what we call this diary work, um, these surveys that go every few weeks, in addition to those diaries, and I should say we call them diaries because we're trying to capture something intimate about the household um, in the way that you know your own personal diary might, but the methodology involves our researchers collecting the data and entering it into a computer system. But in addition to the diary work, we also have been focused on a number of different additional surveys we call modules, which capture different elements of the household's lives. We've got one on their aspirations and attitudes toward broader social um, events. And we've got another on risk preferences, preferences about um, time and um, discounting, financial literacy, financial capability, We're focused on tax time, um, focused on ups and downs of income. We're really trying to get at financial instruments in the informal sector and the formal sector. We are digging deeper on health, which is such a huge part of um, the household's lives. And perhaps another time we'll talk about um, an experimental approach we've layered onto the um, study. One of the reasons that we're spending so much time with the households over the year is that we're interested in ups and downs. Those large surveys that we typically draw from are fantastic, but they usually only see a household once or maybe uh, a few times at different monthly intervals. By spending so much time with the households, really trying to catch week to week variation, we start to see the households in a richer light. And what is coming out at this point of the surveys is a basic problem. You can see that on the next slide. Um, the basic problem of uneven needs. And you all see that and know that from your own experiences. But the households we're um, spending time with face a lot of issues. Um, they're trying to pay their bills. They're trying to keep their um, kids healthy and well fed. They've got health issues, perhaps. Their cars aren't always um, running smoothly. They've got to pay for gas. And so there are uneven needs. And it's those uneven needs matched with uneven earning, um, which constitute the financial challenges of a lot of the households we've come to know and also um, define how they approach financial providers and think about financial strategies. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we discuss you know, specific households today. But I want to put forward um, the one way of of putting this, these ideas together. And this is something that um, came out of earlier work uh, that was abroad. And that's the idea of a triple whammy. The idea when we think about low and moderate income households, um, when we think about the condition of poverty in particular, we focus on those low incomes on average, right? Low average incomes over the year, we put people in buckets based on those kinds of figures. But it's not just low income. There's this other element which is important. And that's irregular and unpredictable income is the fact that for the households we're getting to know, they can't always predict um, how much they're going to be earning, or a lot of them can't, how much they're going to be earning in the months ahead. Makes it hard to budget, makes it hard to plan. And the third element is one that we've all focused a lot on, a lack of financial tools which are appropriate to their issues that allow them to borrow and save easily and deal with those ups and downs. And it's those three things which come together to create what we call the triple whammy. So those are some of the ideas we're exploring. That's a broad overview. We're going to turn um, to Rachel Schneider, who's going to introduce two of the households. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Um, so before I dive into some of the profiles, I need to point out that, as Jonathan mentioned, we are still in the field. And so we aren't by any means finished with the uh, analysis that we'll be doing. And it's too early to draw complete conclusions. Um, however, we think that by thinking about specific households, we can spark ideas and intuitions and uh, bring uh, a face to this general issue that we talk about that we think um, sparks uh, over time, hopefully, innovation in this, in this sector more broadly. 
So I'm going to start and talk about two people. Um, I'll start with Mike Smith. Mike, and I should point out also that we've changed some basic details so that we can protect the anonymity of the households. But the, the spirit of it is very much true. So Mike Smith is a single man in his 50s. He lives alone. He has relationships with his three children, um, but those relationships he reports as being complicated, a little bit fractured. He owns his house, which he bought with an inheritance, and today he works as a building maintenance man. And prior to this, he was self-employed for much of his working life. And he has a lot of frustration about what the structure of his work is now. He feels like he's not certain how much he'll earn. He works overtime regularly, but and that drives what his total income is. But he doesn't know in advance when he'll work overtime or when he'll be paid for that overtime. And that drives uncertainty for him and volatility in his income. He manages that mostly by keeping very tight control over his finances. He relies on cash primarily. He does own a savings account, but he doesn't use it as an active element of managing his life, his cash flow, his day-to-day -day expenses. For his day-to-day -day expenses, he keeps money in cash in his wallet, and he has a very clear system of savings. Once he's accumulated a certain amount of money in his wallet, he takes some out of his wallet and puts it in a particular place in his house. And in fact, he's saving in two different buckets in his house. One is for regular expenses, or, um, and one is a bucket of funds that he's keeping to pay his property tax, which is his largest bill of the year, and he knows he has to be prepared for that in advance. So he thinks a great deal about how to keep control over his finances and has established systems that for him feel very transparent and certain. So if you look at his income, what you see is that he does have a steady job, but that doesn't mean his income doesn't vary. So this goes to Jonathan's point about irregular and unpredictable incomes. And we're looking at some additional analysis of this more general concept throughout the diaries sample right now. And if you are on the US diaries mailing list, you will get that income brief at some point in the next few months. And we think this is a general phenomenon. I bet many people struggle with this same issue. Um, if you look at Mike's expenses, he is a very disciplined spender in the sense that he is careful to spend only in small segments at a time. In fact, in the several month period in which we looked at his finances, he only had a handful of times when he spent more than $25. And he's keeping his, his expenses at $25 um, and below each moment by grocery shopping twice a week rather than once a week, by buying things in small increments. So he goes and buys gas once a week, always on Sundays, and always spends either $15, $20, or $25. So he is absolutely um, correlating his spending with when his income comes in and making sure that he can cover his bills for the most part. Occasionally, he'll not have enough money to pay a particular bill and push it off to the next month, and he is very much um, tracking that closely. And this chart here shows this in greater detail. You'll see that for the most part, he has uh, income that exceeds his recurring expenses. Every once in a while, he dips below. And what we saw in this six-month period is that how he dealt with that was in October, he didn't pay one bill, and he made up for it in November. And that's how he managed that momentary dip. Next, I'll talk a bit about Tim and Clara Adrian. Uh, they are a couple in their 30s. They're married. They don't have children of their own, but they frequently care for foster children. And the foster children is a defining feature of their life, both emotionally and financially. So for them, this is they have strong attachments to the kids that they have taken care of. And in fact, upon the conclusion of our research period, they were in the process of adopting one of the foster children that they um, had had living with them during the research period. They own a house and a car. They have strong connections to their local community. Uh, and their income is also volatility. So in some ways, this is a similar story. If you look at their income stream, 
it is um, the the gray at the top reflects the income they receive from foster care, and that income creates an ongoing volatility in how much cash they have at any one moment. Um, they also had this one spike in August that was related to um, taking money out of um, or, or receiving some extra income that they used for to pay for a vacation. So there's additional in, inputs to their volatility. But it's really interesting to us if you look at um, how their income, how their, I'm going to skip a slide here and say what would happen to their budget if they didn't have this foster income. So here the green line is their income without foster care. The gray line is their household expenses. So if they didn't have this additional income, their finances would be upside down. But the timing of that additional income is all over the place in some ways, right? It, it doesn't come in in a consistent way. It doesn't come in when they have expenses. And so in large part probably as a result of that, what you see is that they are, um, even though the total amount of their expenses are fairly consistent, so we looked at what the range was of their exp their expenses month to month, and they, they were often similar, um, they are for the most part paying all their expenses in lumps. So, and when they would talk about this, they have the feel of always playing catch up. So when they receive money, for example, June 14th, by four days later, they've spent the, more than half of it. Um, in December, of course, this dynamic was exa is exaggerated because of the holidays, you would assume. But there's an ongoing dynamic for them of managing their finances, what I would describe as just in time, a constant bill juggling of what they have cash to pay now versus later. And when the field researcher who works with the family talks with them, you know, she really hears an ongoing, very sophisticated, complicated mental juggling about what to pay when, right? I know, for example, that if I pay this bill late, there won't be consequences, but if I don't pay that bill late, there will be. And that constant juggling is a well, a, a somewhat workable system, and they're making it work. Um, clearly, the source of significant mental energy. Now, Jonathan, why don't I turn it back to you to talk us through the Rodriguez family? Yeah, great. That kind of juggling um, we see all the time in different ways um, in the sample. I want to talk about the third of the three families um, households that we're going to talk about um, today. We Rachel introduced Mike Smith and the Adrians. So the Rodriguez family uh, is not your typical nuclear family. And that's the first thing about them. There are five adults who've come together um, across three generations. They live near San Jose in Northern California. The woman who our field researcher got to know best um, was Maria. Um, the mother in the family, she's 60 years old. And her husband, Dean, is 75. So she's 60, her husband's 75, and her mother is 83. So th those are three adults in the family, and each of them is facing substantial health issues. They have two sons. Maria has two sons, um, Martin, who's 36, Daniel, who's 34, and the two sons are also part of a household. Daniel's contributing a lot um, in terms of income. Martin also is facing um, health issues and alcohol abuse issues. So you've got a family that doesn't look like a typical nuclear family, but it is of the kind that we're seeing more and more frequently, non-typical um, families, and this is a chance to look at how they're dealing. Um, so each of these households has different um, income resources they're bringing in, some from Social Security, disability, and some from um, earned labor. They've got a lot of financial activity going on. They're saving, they're investing, they've got a mortgage, um, they've got annuities, um, They've got health insurance, which is very good news because they otherwise have big uh, health costs. And they're working hard um, to budget, and they've got tools for paying bills like checking accounts, credit cards, um, and they're taking some small loans. So the big question on this household that we ask, although they think it's less of an issue, we think it's a real concern for them, is what would happen if this family came apart? What if the 
grandmother, Regina, the 83-year-old, what if she moved out with her resources? What if Daniel, the working-age um, son, he's 34, earning a good salary, you can see it in the next slide, um, what if he moved out if he got married and um, or just decided to move out? This slide shows their income. If we can go back to the, um, the income slide, the blue, um, the big blue bar there is Daniel's contribution to the family, and it's significant. And it's a great example of how a household has come together to support each other. But by the same token, you can see that if the household were to come apart, and this slide here shows what would happen, um, things would change dramatically. Together, the five of them brought in about $12,000 a month. And here we can see that if Regina moved out, if Daniel moved out, um, they'd be down to about $6,000 um, to support three of them. So it's gone from 12000 for five to 6000 for three. So that's their income. The last part I just want to highlight is their expenses, um, and in particular, their financial situation. One of the um, bars that's probably hard to see here is their home equity line of credit. Um, this is big. They're really highly leveraged. They've got a home equity line of credit, which is worth $216,000. They call it the monster. And we asked Maria, you know, when do you think you're going to pay that off? And her answer is never. It really hangs over their heads. And they're trying to deal with that as well as uh, their mortgage, credit cards, um, and other obligations. And so that's really the Rodriguez's. They've come together. They're really supporting each other. Um, and yet their lives are complex. Their financial lives are um, complex in a way that is specific to them but also represents what we see often across the nation um, in the survey. So let's turn over to um, the discussion. Tim. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, just as a reminder, you can find the detailed uh, household profiles on the U.S. Financial Diary site, and there's a link to that uh, in the chat section of your uh, control window. Um, I want to turn now to Michael Collins. Um, Michael, you've been thinking and studying how consumers make decisions about the financial products that they've offered and particularly the role that policy plays in that. As you look at these profiles, what is it that stands out to you in terms of the decisions that these families are making in managing their financial lives? Uh, th thanks very much. Thanks for, for inviting me to be part of this and for the, the great summary we just heard. Um, you know, the, the stories we hear from these families are, I think, probably a lot more typical than a lot of us. Um, might realize and we see families who probably are um, presenting themselves in in a very positive light they're managing the resources they have in the face of, of great scarcity and you know the differences between the kind of choices that they're making and the kind of choices that we're making really aren't that different the different aren't that different the major difference is the um, the sort of intensity of the ramifications of the choices that are being made uh, versus folks who have more resources and more cushion. I, I often think about that feeling you get when you're driving and your, your gas tank is near empty and that red light comes on. You start to be stressed about how far is it to the gas station, how far can I make it, can I, can I get to my next appointment, and do I have enough time to make that happen. I mean, a lot of ways, the kinds of juggling, this sort of managing the, the payment timing and the income timing, um, is that feeling that people have all the time in, in these situations but that we, that we sometimes experience in the car when we're running out of gas. Um, you know, that said, I think we see a lot of sophistication in the kinds of, of choices that are being made about um, m judging how to manage the payment of uh, the timing of payments with great granularity. I mean, I get the sense that these families are um, very, very keenly aware of how and when payments are processed and how much grace period there is built in on various payments. Um, so we actually see, um, you know, in terms of the sophistication in managing payments is, is, is pretty high. Um, I think there's a number of things about these, um, these profiles that are sort of consistent with what we see with, with lower income households in general. Um, and it may be contrary to what some of the popular wisdom is about how low-income working families manage their money. 
I mean, we do see some engagement with the financial system. Um, it may be non-traditional from, from the perspective of a, of a middle-class household, but it's um, definitely taking advantage of financial products and systems um, that are available to them and, and it makes sense for their needs. I think it's also easy to look at some of the decisions that families make in these situations and cast judgment. Um, you know, from professional wisdom, this wouldn't be the level of debt or the type of product that we would recommend and maybe it violates some of those rules of thumb that we might think about. I think it gets too easy to judge the kinds of preferences and choices that families make about what's important to them. We can't judge whether uh, kids or foster kids are important or if having cable or, or paying uh, ties to the church is an important task. So um, I do think it challenges some of the assumptions that we often see in maybe the popular press or popular discussions about what working families are doing with the resources they do have available to them. Um, you know, overall, I, I think there's so much value in these stories, and I'm so looking forward to the to the broader set of data that's going to come forth, because these issues of volatility and um, how families find traditional and non-traditional forms of liquidity to make ends meet is, is really um, fascinating, and I think helps inform not only from a you know, researcher's perspective, understand how decisions are made, but might even help us think about financial products and the role of public programs. How are public policies designed? The uh, you know whether it's the payment systems that we use for collecting um, taxes or other kinds of of uh, public related uh, fee processing, as well as the timing and and the form in which payments are made from from public systems. Um, so I do think there's a a lot to be learned, and I do look forward to the next phase. Thanks, Michael. Uh, I'm going to turn in a second uh, to Kathy, but wanted to remind everyone that you can. Uh, ask a question by typing into the question window on your control panel. Uh, we've got a number of questions coming in and I'll start turning to those in just a moment, but uh, Kathy, I wanted to ask your reaction as someone who's intimately involved in the process of trying to serve some of these customers. Uh, looking at these profiles, um, what comes to mind in terms of the design of products that are appropriate to the challenges these families are facing? Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I, I, um, that's the, the point of view that I had as I was um, reviewing the profiles and, and even reflecting on today's conversation is, you know, what are the, the interventions and strategies that we can be connecting um, households to? And um, I, I do first want to uh, step back and really commend CFSI and MIU Financial Access Initiative for, um, for doing this work because I feel like these diaries present, you know, the diaries we've looked at today present three really different pictures of choices and strategies that households are employing, both for getting by and planning for the future. Um, and the stories, is, you know, as Michael had mentioned, the stories are very typical of many um, and, and many that we hear sort of every day in the field. But what I think is really sort of uniquely helpful about this kind of an approach is it's sort of taking that personal story and supplementing it with, you know, the tracking and analysis of the financial conditions and the trends over time. And as a result, when you, by taking the personal story and sort of comparing that to the pattern of earning and consumption, savings and borrowing, you can start seeing certain patterns that emerge and certain trend, uh, certain interventions that could be injected or, you know, connected to these households that might help them kind of deal with this volatility and these ebbs and flows. Um, and I feel like it's a, it's a great time for to be doing this because, um, you know, even uh, where we are now as a field um, with the, we have such a broader array of tools and interventions than I think even we had, you know, five or ten years ago. There's a range of community development financial institutions. There's all this financial empowerment work, the financial counseling and coaching. So I feel like there's, we as a field are kind of in a much better place to be connecting to households like this and to be looking at different profiles and recognizing that not there's no one size fits all. It's not like everybody needs to go through the same type of intervention to be able to move to the next step. Um, when I sort of looked at the at the three profiles, you know, I could see there's sort of different types of packaging of interventions for each of these situations. You know, you look at the case of Mike Smith, and I was really struck by the extent to which his personal story really affects his financial condition and the choices that he's making. So 
you know, it's a case where there's a strong personal need for control, for very a very close managing of the finances, which is enabling him to be able to sort of uh, be managing his ebbs and flows of income, but it might also be limiting what he's going to be able to do in sort of planning for the future and thinking about, you know, times ahead. And so, you know, at first blush, in looking at it, you say, well, here's somebody who definitely needs to get connected up to a responsible financial institution in the, in the area to get into a good savings account to begin using these sort of moments where he has, you know, he has surplus income, he can be directing it into savings. But then when you look a little bit more deeply and you listen to sort of some of the stories about, you know, his broader issues around with trust, um, you start realizing that perhaps there's, there's also an important need for sort of an intervention that's about, you know, a, a disinterested party providing some financial counseling and coaching, somebody who's not trying to sell him a product, somebody who's not trying to get him to do something. And I feel like that, you know, and, and even in this case, um, it may be somebody who would really benefit from approach. I feel like there's a lot of opportunities to look at that and think about how do you pack education, counseling, access to good products and services. I was um, fascinated by the Rodriguez, Rodriguez model because I, you know, it really reflects a, a, a high level of financial engagement and strategies that are already being sold. And, you know, without sort of the specific terms of the different finances they have, you know, it really sort of immediately me that sitting down with the local CDFI, um, and luckily in San Jose there's one of the best in the country um, located nearby, you know, having a household like that be able to sit down with a CDFI lender who could kind of take a look at the terms and conditions of that HELOC, you know, a, a case where their first mortgage, they're close to paying down, Perhaps there's a way to think about a refinancing opportunity that would extend out some of those long-term payments that would help to sort of even out and plan for those future potentially lower income streams coming into the household and sort of extend it into a, into a longer period. And, you know, there's a lot of different ways that um, I think in these different ho household opportunities where we now have sort of this nice broad array of of interventions that we could be connecting folks to, um, but but again, the, we're no longer in a place where we have only one size. And clearly, this these diaries really reflect that the one size fits all approach isn't isn't what these households need. I think in each case, we have we have a lot of different tools and approaches to be connecting them to. Um, so I'm I'm really thrilled by. Um, by this deep dive, I think the data combined with the storytelling is really critical and um, I think is really going to help us be able to create sort of um, a much broader configuration of how we approach low-income households with, with what we have to offer. So thank you for inviting me to, to join today. Well, thanks, Kathy, for that. Uh, I want to turn to a question for, for everyone. Um, here on our, our panelists that it reflects a theme that I know we've been thinking a lot but is also a lot of the questions that are coming in is this question of uh, given the range of products that these people are, are using and the range of problems that they face what does it really mean to say good financial products or appropriate financial products for these people how should we be thinking about what it what good products for these these families are Jonathan, why don't I start with you? That's a it's a it's an interesting and hard question. Um, you know, one of the things which becomes clear from getting to know the households very well is that when they're using any one financial product, and we often think about the products one by one, um, but when we see them using any one financial products, they're using it alongside another product or maybe a second or a third product, and so when we think about what a good financial product is, it really needs to be seen within the portfolio of products people are using. Um, that something that's not a great product um, could actually help bridge um, a particular set of products that they're having or something that um, is a good product might actually not be working so well within a broader portfolio. So the, one of the 
perspectives we're taking from this, um, and it's still early, is that instead of thinking only about product, it's thinking about you know the entirety of people's financial lives. But I, I do think we're starting to see some elements or characteristics of products that matter a lot. And Mike Smith's um, story is a great example of how transparency and control really matter when you're juggling, when you're, you know, really trying to um, make things work even to the day. You really want to make sure that you know a product is clear, that it's not going to surprise you with different fees, um, and that you can rely on it. Uh, really in a very fine-grained way. I'm sure that, that Kathy and um, Rachel and Michael have um, sharper things to say on this. Um, that's my general perspective. Well, Michael, let me throw it over to you because, you know, obviously there's a policy question here too and what we define as appropriate and good products for some of these audiences. Yeah, you know, one of the things that strikes me about how we, we design a lot of products with the um, the traditional household and maybe it gets paid once a month and has a relatively static set of, of expenses and a relatively static set of or relatively um, even income from month to month. And we see from these households just that volatility is so great. And you can imagine financial products where um, due dates were chunked into more and particularly with electronic payments, more minutia. So we, we you know instead of monthly payments, weekly payments or even tighter increments than that or um, allowing for um, repayments on certain kinds of bills and debt to be um, timed um, differently at different times of the year or the amounts being different over time. And so, you know, we've seen some examples of financial products with these kinds of features, but often aimed more at very high end, uh, <laughs> high wealth people um, who are playing other kinds of games with their, their income and expenses. Um, but certainly we could imagine much more innovation in the, in the product sphere where, um, you know, we acknowledge the fact that this volatility is something that, that families are facing. I think in terms of public policy, the way we, you know, we generally um, execute subsidy payments for, whether it's for foster care parents or, or other kinds of, of public programs, tends to be this very, you know, first of the month or 15 of the month kind of models. And um, again, with electronic payments, there's probably some good reasons what we might think about offering people the option of spreading those payments out with more granularity over, over the course of the month. Kathy, I would just add that... Uh, Rachel, uh, CFS... Oh, go ahead, Kathy. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I would add that, you know, the, the there is a component to, um, you know, particularly credit products, you know, where underwriting um, really matters and really using the underwriting process to determine along with the individual or household, you know, how that credit offering is going to best work with that situation and obviously um, you know we don't want to limit access to credit by you know overdoing it on um, you know requiring you know high barriers to entry to get people in but there you know there there is a lot to be said for products that do um, work with a family's ebbs and flows and really help them think about the affordability aspects at the peaks as uh, the valleys as well as the peaks. Uh, Rachel, CFSI is obviously at a nexus in terms of innovation around products to meet needs. Uh, interested in your thoughts on how well the overall industry is doing in terms of innovating products that are going to be useful to the families that we're seeing in the diaries. No, it's a tough question to answer. I think that the we are seeing a, a lot of exciting innovation that is directly relevant to the kinds of issues that we're raising here. And I would um, second everything that Jonathan and Michael and Kathy have said so far about how you think about good products. So on the one hand, um, in order for a product to be genuinely helpful in somebody's financial life, it has to, in, in its ideal world, it would take into account the individual's total financial life. Um, so a credit issuer, for example, would underwrite and know enough about the person's total finances that they'd know that the loan was going to be able to be safely repaid. And CFSI is doing a lot of work to try and think that through, um, through our Compass Principles project. And I think there is a sense here in which the 
industry naturally lags that full vision because the data is simply not available uh, about all customers or the technology is simply not there yet. And so I see a lot of promise around underwriting in particular on the idea that um, increasingly we're going to use just a vast amount of data to understand somebody's financial life and that data will be usable by lenders in a way that enables them to make a more robust assessment of somebody's ability to repay, for example. And I think that same trend is relevant when you think about payment innovation. So I think it is absolutely the case that people need more mechanisms that will help them manage their money real time and that the more we payer, payees know or the more that employers know about what their employee's financial picture is, the more we can help people to time their inflows and outflows effectively. So I think there's a lot going on. The other thing I would point out is that um, I'm particularly enthused by the, the innovation you see in, in financial technology around, for example, getting cash in and out of the system. So somebody like Mike Smith, for example, sees real benefits by working in cash, and yet there are obvious drawbacks as well, right? He's subject to theft, he's subject to loss by keeping his funds in cash. So there are benefits to helping him engage in the electronic payment system, but he also is going to want to keep control over his finances. And so there's increasingly um, ways to use technology to give people that feeling of control over their money with real-time balance alerts or with um, other mechanisms that help them to maintain the sense of transparency and control while also leveraging the benefits of electronic payments. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, want to take a step back here because a number of people have questions about the the, the methodology of the study and the, the practice of the data collection. Um, want to let everyone know that in the next few weeks we're publishing an in-depth brief on the methodology. So if you're interested in that, do go to the usfinancialdiaries.org site and sign up for our research alerts. There's a link for that in the upper right corner of the page. But Jonathan, would you take a few moments to talk about uh, two methodological issues? One is uh, how were the families selected, um, and how concerned are you about the practice of intensive data gathering changing the behaviors of these families? Thanks, Tim. Those are two really good questions. Um, let me start with the second one first. How concerned are we um, about how this sort of intensive engagement will actually uh, change the way that people think about their lives and go about their lives? So how is that going to bias things? We, at the end of um, the survey period, we asked households that question straight up because we just wanted to know in their own sense, um, you know, how much of a difference it made that our field researchers were visiting them every three weeks. And most of them said, yeah, this has made me more aware of where my money is going. I really didn't have a sense of where all of it's going. It may be that, you know, the um, uh, one of the household uh, heads is in charge of finance, doesn't know what his or her spouse is doing um, entirely with their money. And this process really helped them see it more or helped them get a handle on just how in debt they are. So yeah, it's changed things. At the same time, what's so striking is that even though the process of being in the survey has made people more aware of their economic and financial situation, we still see households struggling. We still see them you know, at the end of the month with not enough money to um, pay all their bills. We still see them um, doing lots of things that I think all of us uh, worry about and are concerned about um, in this community. And so, in a sense, it biases us towards seeing a best case scenario, um, but it doesn't mean that we aren't seeing all the typical behaviors, um, you know, that motivated the study in the first place and you know, had pushed us to ask that question, just how do families get through the year? Now, the first question is on household selection, and that's a really interesting thing. It's not a random sample. Um, what we're really looking for is typical households in the community. So we started off looking for households and um, households that would meet certain income criteria, certain family structure criteria. We have about a third of the households below the national poverty line, at least at the start. 
about a third that are between national poverty line and twice the national poverty line, and a third that's above that. So broadly low and moderate income. Uh, we chose different regions of the country so that we could capture the immigrant experience, we could capture um, different age structures, we could capture different regulations. And the method that we used from a sort of purely academic standpoint is something called the snowball method, where we asked a household or we asked a community partner to introduce us to a household, then we asked that household to introduce us to other households, and that household to introduce us to other households, and in that way, we generated a um, sample of the community. I just want to say one last thing on this, which is, you know, our goal is to identify, just like you saw today, households that are typical of different problems, different challenges, different opportunities. It is not um, to test hypotheses, but instead to explore conditions, to try to understand from households in their own language, in their own situations, um, what's really going on and how they see problems. So we're really looking for more typical experiences than for a random sample of America. There are already great surveys that do that, but not enough studies that do what we're doing. And it's a great privilege to be able to get to know these households well. Uh, Rachel and Kathy, one question that I'd like both of you to chime in on that, um, again, is one of these that's flowing through a lot of the questions that we're receiving. It, it sort of has two aspects. One is, uh, are there patterns in the households in terms of their trust of financial institutions in general? Uh, but then more broadly, and Kathy, I'd love for you to, to talk about this, the, the challenge of providing um, good financial advice. Who do people trust and how do you get them to trust uh, the financial advice that they're getting from uh, people who may look a lot like people that they shouldn't trust? I'll, uh, this is Kathy. I'll take a stab at the, um, this, I guess, a combination of the two. Uh, you know, that question of trust and trust of financial institutions is a really important one. I think, um, uh, I think Jonathan touched on before um, the importance of transparency in products and services across the board and simplicity as a way to make sure people are comfortable and you know, that we're sort of rebuilding trust um, for people kind of, kind of to come back into the financial system or engage in ways um, that they can feel comfortable, they can feel like they're empowered enough to know that they're making the best choices for their households. So I think the more complex and the less disclosures on, on the details of the products, the harder that is to do and the more the trust is, is really damaged. Um, in terms of the financial counseling or, or sort of advising, you know, I, I think it really is important. And I, I was very struck by the Mike Smith uh, profile, particularly because, you know, it was clearly indicative of a person who did have trust issues broadly. And, you know, I think just the idea of, well, we need to get them into, you know, into a good financial institution and have the folks there sort of tell them about the products and services is often, um, it's, it's not necessarily going to help people who might be naturally distrustful or have had bad experiences in the past to kind of overcome that. I think it's really important that there, um, that we're building a better infrastructure of resources and resource people at the local level um, who are sort of disinterested financial advisors, counselors, coaches, um, it's really important that they not be linked to institutions who have something to gain. Um, and that's even the case, you know, sometimes with, you know, with community development financial institutions, um, it's important that they have opportunities and connectivity to financial counseling and coaching. But, you know, most community development credit unions, if they do have financial counselors or coaches on staff, they may you know, they'll, they'll sort of take extra steps to make sure that that's a position that's perceived and is actually removed from the business of uh, running the financial institution. And I think that kind of, um, you know, being really upfront and purposeful about making sure people understand that, you know, you're getting advice from somebody today who won't benefit in any way, shape, or form by the outcomes of your decision in a financial way. Um, really matters. 
um, and and that's not always been the case. I do think we're we're light years ahead of where we used to be on this. I still think there's a lot um, of effort um, and opportunity to, to to move forward. I think some of the municipal financial empowerment efforts, some of the work that nonprofits are doing around financial capability and financial empowerment, and and certainly the work of CDFIs provided they're sort of keeping it clear that it's sort of a separate function. Um, you know, is taking us a, a lot of the way there, but but many, many, many communities don't have those resources yet. So I think there's a lot of, of need for us to figure out sort of some way to link folks up to good advice, um, either virtually by phone or 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 through live chats and and uh, and email. Tim and Kathy, I think another related point that I want to offer about this is that. Um, your question to me points out an opportunity to talk about the theme of connection that we see in many of the households. So most of the households that we talk with seem to have some financial connections with their friends or family, their broader community in some way. And that comes through really strongly if you talk about the Rodriguez's where three generations are living together. But it, it's the case for the Adrians as well where when they're short on bills they borrow from, an, from a cousin or a brother. And no matter how short they are, they come up with the funds to give money to their church or to contribute food to a potluck in their community, right? And so I think this is connected to the issue of trust because there's a tendency to think about financial services as though it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship between an individual and an institution. And the reality is that people manage their financial lives in groups. They manage them as couples or as families or as a broader community. And while individuals within that community may have relationships with institutions and accounts that they hold alone, the totality of their financial life and the financial decisions they make are very much tied up with each other. And I think that holds the key to being able to provide financial advice that is um, independent and valuable and timely at scale. Because if you don't think about the need only to provide each individual with greater knowledge and exposure to financial services um, that are high quality and good for them, if you don't think about it as a, something you've got to do person by person across the country, but instead as information that you need to be able to embed within a community, I think that opens up your mind to the possibilities for greater creativity and greater scale. And so, for example, you start to think about um, social media and its use and the extent to which online communities can be ones where people positively reinforce financial behaviors that can lead to greater well-being. And so I think there's a lot here that's, that's still to be explored when you think about how to increase the financial well-being of, of communities overall. Mm. Michael and Jonathan want to turn to you on the question of uh, these families, many have systems that they're using to get by at least, uh, but in these profiles those systems don't necessarily seem to be helping them get ahead. Uh, given that these families do have some entrenched ways of dealing with their financial lives, how do these profiles get you thinking about uh, what could be done to help them improve on their own terms their financial lives? Michael, let's start with you. Yeah, no, I, I, I guess I would start uh, by turning the tables a little bit and, and saying for people in the financial industry who are in, in retail financial services or um, at, at some of the great community development credit unions that are out there and, and as they look at this, how can they create products that are better adapted to the circumstances that the working families, the complex families that we see in these in these um, stories, and um, you know, part of it is to what extent can the market better serve this uh, type of consumer by you know sort of shaking up some of the traditional frameworks that they've been using in the past. But I also think, on the other hand, there are examples here of of people who are probably doing the best they can with the tools that are available to them and um, to some extent, there might be tools that they're not aware of, and, I, and that's where I think this idea of a coach or an advisor comes into play. But I would 
I would just caution that we we see examples of when a financial institution and even a very enlightened one um, has some initiative to try to to work with working families and to train people to work with working families. Is, there's just a lot of prejudgments that come come with that about what people ought to do and what products they ought to use and why this product's a bad or that bad. And it's just, I, I can't um, you know overemphasize what's important about this whole project is we're listening to what people are saying about their perceptions of products, why they value the products, why even though it might cost more, they may actually prefer a product because of the convenience or because of the transparency or the trust. And so I do think it's more complex than just this particular product costs more, this particular product seems to have some some features of risk that we we shirk at. Uh, so I think it does become much more um, uh, you know, much more of an art form in some ways for, for people in the financial industry and for policymakers to think about um, what are the sort of terms and conditions or the principles that ought to guide the development of products that serve this population. So this is Jonathan, and I'm totally on board with everything Michael just said. Um, and I just on the question really briefly, um, I, I think that that opposition between systems that help households get by versus um, systems that help, help help households get ahead, that may not be the right frame. And you know, this is one of the things we've been really trying to learn from the households. Instability really matters to the households. That kind of instability is weighing households down. It's shifting priorities. And a working hypothesis is that helping households get by in a more reliable way, create a little more stability and comfort in their lives, may well be one of the most powerful things that can happen to them to help them get ahead. Thanks for that. We're uh, pushing against our time limit here, so I um, want to wrap us up with a couple of thoughts. One is that uh, we have had a great deal of um, questions being asked. Uh, and one of the reasons that we had this webinar is because we are interested in the questions coming from uh, from others, and so the we may not have had a chance to answer your particular question, but rest assured that that is shaping what we're going to be looking at in the data over the course of the next year. We do have a very, very rich data set here that we're going to be analyzing for quite some time. Uh, to that point, though, uh, I do want to encourage all of you again, because we are going to be producing this research and it is going to be informed by questions that we get in forums like this, uh, please do take the time to sign up for our research alerts on the usfinancialdiaries.org site so that as we produce uh, a steady stream of research into all this data that we've gathered uh, for the last year, uh, you'll have access um, to that uh, stream of research. Uh, and please do feel free to re reach out to us as well with other questions. Uh, given the response to this webinar, uh, I, with a high degree of probability, we'll predict we'll be doing some more of these uh, over the course of the next few months, talking about more of the research coming out of the U.S. Financial Diaries project. So with that, let me say thank you to all of our attendees and to Rachel, Jonathan, and to Michael and Kathy from our advisory board. Uh, we're immensely excited about this research and about the insights that we're gaining, uh, but even more so about the interest that it's generating because we think uh, this level of insight into households is what we need to build uh, better products um, and provide these families better tools for both in, uh, their stability um, and their futures. So with that, uh, we're going to sign off. Thanks again for everyone for participating, and we're looking forward to interacting and hearing more from you in the future. Take care. <laughs>